Good morning, everyone. My brother in the back, you confirm I still have a heartbeat with this? Yes? We're going? That's good. It's probably going to start racing faster now, because our time is short, isn't it? Well, thank you again for welcoming us amongst you this morning. It's a pleasure always to go and trust in the Lord and serve the Lord. And there is a blessing in the gathering of the saints and in the fellowship of the brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's always uh, good that wherever we go, uh, we find that, because God is faithful. And He saves for Himself a remnant everywhere He goes. And uh, just by way of a quick testimony, it's always good to know where people come from. Uh, you know it for all uh, my other brothers and sisters here, so I might as well let you know as well. My name is Sony. Um, I was born in Ontario. I can call it unterrible because I was born there. Uh, but it's not that terrible because it's a place that has been created by the Lord as well. Uh, I was deported out of Ontario at the age of three days. And uh, they said, you go to Quebec because you don't belong here. So I grew up on the other side of the fence. So I speak a strange language sometimes it's called Franglish. It's French and English. I don't know too much which is which. Uh, so if you can't understand, you'll have to bear with me and forgive me uh, for that. But we should, we should be able to continue in English for now. Um, I uh, lived in Montreal from 1994 to 2006. And in 2006, I moved to B.C., where I wound up in Pemberton, of all places, just a little ways up the coast from uh, Vancouver. And um, I actually came to the Lord and met the Lord in Whistler, of all places, which may seem strange uh, to a lot of you because it's known as uh, a place of party, a place of uh, tourism, a place to go and have fun. And a lot, a, a lot of people, of which a lot of my friends actually, uh, find themselves to be worshipers of the creation rather than the creator. And uh, as much as it deeply saddens my heart, um, I keep praying and trusting in the Lord that for them, as much as for others, for as long as there is life, there is hope. And um, I very much appreciate um, the prayer request for the children of divorce being one myself. And uh, I can attest to the reality that uh, God hates divorce, and God never intended divorce. And it leaves consequences far beyond what we can imagine. But God is good. And through all that, He goes to leaps and bounds to reach those that suffered that great separation in the Garden of Eden, even from the beginning, started right in Genesis, that God was in perfect fellowship with man, and all of a sudden, sin comes in, and separation, and divorce to that extent. But all the other chapters after Genesis 3 are God working at fixing that. And so 2,000 years ago, we have this person, this man, who is also God, who is called Jesus Christ, who came. And interestingly enough, uh, we see that God created man in his own image, and that image was lost. And by Genesis 5, man is reproducing according to his own image, not the image of God anymore. And then God comes in the flesh, in the image of man, that he would restore man to the image of God. In the crucifixion, in the resurrection, in the everlasting life of Christ. And that is the good news. That is the gospel. That is the inheritance that we have, that even gathering here today, we live in this hope. That it's not in vain. It's not futile. It is for real. The man... Jesus Christ was a real man, and he was also the real God. And he lived and died and rose again, and rose to the Father and lives forever in here. I don't know if my brother out there can hear it, but this is the heart of Jesus that beats in everyone who receives him. And because of that, we have hope. And that is amazing. 
and that is the risen life of Christ that uh, hopefully all here share and will share for eternity. Today, uh, it is a privilege to be here. It's always a privilege to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust that uh, even if we stumble on our words, even if we don't say it the right way, that His word is sharper than the two-edged sword as we read in Hebrews 4 verse 12 that it reaches down to the marrows and through the bones and ligaments and all tendons and sinews and everything. So if there is something, someone, some word that nudges your heart today, that encourages your heart today, that stirs your heart to be reconciled with God today, it's not my words, it's His word. And His word is faithful. And so we will look at um, some of it today. Without further ado, because time is always short, and time is always running out on us. Um, Today being February 14 is an interesting uh, day. It's a day where love is celebrated, and so we will actually speak of it, but in a different way. We will speak of obedience. And why is obedience even relevant Because obedience is demanded from our Lord. And obedience is imparted upon us from our Lord. And if he demands that we obey him, it's not because it's a mere act of piety that it does anything good for us, but it's because he is who he is. It's because being God, he knows what is best for us, And as parents here can all attest to this, I am sure, you deeply want what is the best for your children. And it just so happens that God knows what is the best for our children and for us. And he knows that the best for us is himself and obedience to all that he commands. And so out of this deep love that he has for us, that for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I trust that these uh, words and this message was shared with you last week by my uh, friend and brother Jeffrey Thudian, whom I believe was here last week, uh, speaking to you about the uh, unbreakable and unshakable uh, inheritance that we have in Christ and his fellowship. So we read in Romans... Uh, chapter 5 verse 19 for as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners we're, we're going to put it we're going to call it what it is we're going to put his name out there his name is Adam I have the apple right here even so through the, the obedience of the one with a big O namely Jesus Christ the many will be made righteous. So here is laid before us the principle of disobedience and obedience. So let's uh, have a quick look at the subject matter here uh, today. God calls us to obedience. Now, I was raised in a Roman Catholic setting. I'm sure many of you, and so, or some of you at least, are familiar with that. And, and there's a lot of teaching in there, or at least some understanding, that our salvation... Or we must deserve our heavenly place. We must earn our salvation through some good deeds. And the truth is, the good deeds in obedience and faith are inseparable. But they are reversible. Or at least so it is in different teachings. And I would beg to plead with you today that Uh, as much as some claim salvation through good deeds, and the uh, uh, Apostle James write that that, that, um, faith without deeds is dead in the book of James. So are deeds necessary? They actually do nothing for us from a salvation standpoint. Because it is said in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 10, That is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, not by works that no one can boast. And then it's a gift from God. And then the Apostle James calls us to be working good deeds. 
Well, Scripture is clear and abundantly clear, I believe, that those good deeds are the result of our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. So faith comes first and the good deeds come after. And it's very clear all through Scripture that calls us to be obedient to Him. And right from the onset of Genesis, God calls man to be obedient in the Garden of Eden. It's not exactly used and said in these words, but in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, there's somebody in command here, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but... There's the infamous little three-letter word, but. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Two little verses that give us a whole lot to ponder, isn't it? There is a command. There is the principle of obedience. And there is the principle that disobedience will have consequences. And you are familiar with Genesis chapter 3, I'm sure, that disobedience did occur. And consequences did occur. And so we can ask, does God have the right to demand obedience? I think so. I think so. If we study his, war, his name, actually, one of his name, and we study this at Cape and Ray, we study namely four names. God has many more names, but we study four of them at Cape and Ray. Uh, one of them is the name Adonai. I'm sure it's a name that sounds familiar from hymns and old, old texts and scripture itself. Um, the name Adonai comes from the root Adon, which means sovereign, controller. Lord, Master, and Owner, and Ruler. Now this name in the Hebrew can be used for man and for God when we leave it to Adon. But when you add the end of it to say Adonai, this is one of the proper names of God. Only one person is ever referred to as Adonai in all of Scripture and history, and this is God Himself. And this means that God is the ultimate sovereign, supreme authority over all things, over all the earth, over all creation. And He created all things, and under Him all things are set. And so by who He is, by the splendor of His name and the greatness of His majesty, He can ask obedience. He has the place and the privilege to ask obedience. He is not accountable to any. He is bigger than the biggest that you can imagine that He is. And so He demands obedience and He deserves obedience. In the Greek, in the New Testament, it's the word kurios, kurios that is used 577 times in the New Testament to speak of the Lord Almighty. Master and ruler over all. Today's motto is what? I'm sure you all know. Do what you want. Today's society is raised in this ideal. Do what you want. And I have seen in many places, brought along with Christianity, do what you want. And yet God says, there was a way that seems right to a man in the Proverbs, but in the end it leads to death. And the world preaches, do what you want, but the Word of God teaches, do what God says. And we'll just look at a few passages in Scripture here. Um, just briefly, I'll go through these verses quickly, that definitely reiterates that command. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, one of the wisest men, or the wisest man on earth at his time anyway, King Solomon, wrote, 
The conclusion is this, that when all has been heard, fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. In the New Testament, so many times there's a provision for obedience on all grounds. In the book of Acts, Peter and the apostles answers to the scribes and rulers. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, he says, We must obey God rather than men. The Apostle Paul, in many of his writings, says, in Ephesians 6, 5, says, Slaves, employees, people under authority, today, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your hearts as to on Christ. We all have people over us, and we're all called to obedience. To the children, he says, obey your parents in the Lord. Are you bound to obey them if they ask you to do something that is sin before God? I would beg to defer. But in as much as they are in the Lord and appointed as your parents, God says, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And here comes a very, a very good one, but a very difficult verse to stomach, particularly for me who has issues with pride. I know pride. Am I alone? Probably not. But it is vicious. And it comes at every corner of our lives, possibly. And the Apostle Peter says in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Do what you want. Not exactly. Difficult to do. But because God loves us so much, He knows that this is what we should do. And why should we? Because it actually speaks of His greatness and of His love to the watching world. And it is a testimony to all those who see and observe. Jesus spells out the command to obedience very, very clearly in the gospel in two places. He says, when the, when the people are asking, are saying to Jesus, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. What does he say? He says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he says in Matthew 12, verse 50, he says, For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. And in the Gospel of Luke, in a different circumstance, when a lady stands out of the crowd and says, Blessed is the womb that bore you in the breast at which you nursed. Jesus says, But on the contrary, he doesn't say yes, but, that's also good. He says, On the contrary, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Command to obedience. What are the blessings of obedience? There's got to be a blessing. There's got to be some perks at the end of this if we, if, if we dare to obey the Lord, right? We read in Exodus 23, verse 22, it says, But if you obey, truly obey His voice, it says. And that is the voice of the angel of the Lord. And that is the voice of Jesus. If you truly obey His voice and do all that I say, then I, God, will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. What does that mean? It means, beloved brothers and sisters, that when we obey God and take Him at His word, He fights the battles of life for us. He fights in the tribulations and the trials that we face. And can He win the battle? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he can. And he already has in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for all things. Put an end to death. The enmity that was be between man and God. He's already done that. 
And that, I believe, is amazing. And there are many other passages in Scripture that reiterates that He goes before us and that God works all things for those who love Him and obey Him. And there's a principle in Scripture that's the principle of rest. If we just think of Moses, Moses, I don't think there's any question mark on his salvation, is there? He was one of the people that appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we have certainty that he is with the Lord. But what happened at the end of his days? Because he was disobedient at the rock. And instead of obeying God's command to speak to the rock, he smote it twice in frustration of the grumbling people. And God said, because of this, because of your disobedience, you shall not enter the promised land. You shall not enter my rest, he says. There are challenges in obeying God. It is said in Scripture in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is it possible to live the Christian life? Is it difficult? Is it challenging? This is bad news. It's impossible. On our own, it's impossible. But with Christ that lives in us, it is Him Himself who is living His own life in our life. And that is the indwelling life of Christ. The consequences of disobedience briefly on the subject matter. I'll just bring to you a story that's out in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. You can read it for yourselves. We don't have time to read the whole chapter. But it's just to point out that in disobedience, there are consequences not just for us, but that impact other people too. And this story dramatically changed the way I live my life. Because we think of Big Brother, who's watching. Everybody's heard of that concept? <laughs> Let's call it Big Brother, that's right. You know what I'm talking about. And we go to places and we're, we're concerned that there are cameras in the buildings and that the microphones are recording things and all of these, right? Well, there's another bad news here. God is omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient and he knows and sees all things how much of our days how much even of my days I walk and I do things without necessarily pondering on the reality that God sees all of it and I oh yeah well oh, you know I find this thing yeah maybe I could just keep it you know finders keepers and things like that but Really, God sees it all. All of it. And in the story of Achan, in Joshua chapter 7, there's a man in the camp of Israel who is disobedient. And then what happens? Very briefly, give you an outline there. Um, God says, there's sin in the camp. There's a problem. Israel is losing the battle. And the man, Achan, comes forth, and in verse 20 he says, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. There's confession. And let's see what happens in that story. Verse 24 to 26, it says, Then Joshua and all Israel within, with him took Achan, the man who sinned, and the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons and daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up in the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you to this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. God means business. 
when he's talking about obedience. And so the sin of one man had ripple effects and implications on a whole lot of other people with him who were not up on that. And brothers and sisters, this is the reality of disobedience. When we do, there are other people who are impacted by that. And in the disobedience of divorce, there are children who pay the price of all these things. And this is really, really, really sad, actually. But God, praise the Lord, we live on this side of the cross and we live on this side of the grace, isn't it? Amen to that. Because this is no longer the way God deals with disobedience in our world, but we know mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ and grace in His risen life that He gives us. That at the foot of the cross, there is forgiveness, not for one sin, not for two, for all, all sin. And that in the resurrection of Christ out of the grave, there is life eternal, regardless of what we may have done, regardless of the sin in the camp before we come to Jesus. And even in the times that we fail after the fact, that when we come to the foot of the cross, there is complete forgiveness. Jesus doesn't heal temporarily, partially. He heals completely and fully. And when we consider this, we can only be amazed that Jesus is our example of obedience. Today, the Lord says, go and sin no more. He doesn't say, bring them out at the, at the gate of the city and stone them and burn them. He says, today, go and sin no more. And that is amazing. We read in Philippians 2.8 that Jesus, although being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on the cross. Are we willing to be disobedient? I mean, not disobedient, but this much obedient to our Father, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke says in the Gospel, Father, speaking of Jesus, Jesus is speaking here, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. This is the man Jesus speaking. And then at the very end of this verse, the God Jesus speaking says, Yet not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus says in the Gospel of John, in a few passages, I can do nothing of my own initiative, but all things I see the Father do, and teach me, I do. This is our example of obedience. Why? Because God loves us so much that He willingly laid out His life for a mine, for ours. And so He demands obedience. But the great news in that is that I can't obey on my own. I can't do it. Sin's crouching at the door, always. One of the most vicious one being pride. But through Christ, who strengthens me, I can do all things, it says in Scripture. It is the risen life of Christ that we receive by faith in what He has done. That gives us the power over sin every day of our lives. That gives us victory over disobedience every day of our lives. And that when we come at the foot of the cross in repentance, the love of God is poured out upon us so richly that we receive His eternal life. Isn't that amazing? How can we do to walk in obedience very quickly? 
set our minds on the things from above. Pray without ceasing, it says in Scripture. Spend some time in the Word. Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day in and day, in and day out. Day in, day out, day and night. It says in Psalm 119, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. It also says in Scripture that bad company corrupts good morales. Sometimes we need to adjust the people we hang around with. And we must maintain fellowship with the saints. In Hebrew chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, it says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He is faithful indeed. Amen. And let us consider how to stimulate one another unto disobedience. No. Unto love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing. I hope these words are encouraging to you, brothers and sisters in our walk of obedience, in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That because He has given us all the blessings in the spiritual realms, we can trust in His provision, be empowered by His risen life daily. And if we fall, repent. Come to Him. Receive forgiveness. And walk in the newness of life every day. And that is the love story, really. That God so loved us that He sent His beloved Son, that He would die for us and rise again, that we may have eternal life and walk in obedience every day. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the richness of Your Word, but mostly for the richness of Your life. For the complete forgiveness we receive at the foot of the cross of Calvary, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging His resurrection, and therefore walking in the power of life, in the power of the risen Lord. And Father, we pray that we continue to maintain a steadfastness in obedience to You, knowing that this obedience doesn't come merely from us, but comes from Your risen life in us, that gives us strength to walk every day. And so we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.